Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Little Fish panel from Physical to Digital, uh, Thriving and Growing. Uh, I am very grateful uh, to be with you uh, here today uh, virtually uh, with our panelists. We'll go ahead and just go around the room uh, and we'll allow the panelists to kind of introduce themselves. I'll talk a little bit about myself, uh, give you a summary of uh, what Little Fish has been doing, then we'll open it up for some larger discussions about art, comics, um, and the nonprofit kind of intersection of all those things, um, specifically to San Diego, but um, in uh, a universal sense as well. Um, all right, uh, Mark, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Mark Hobegger. Um, I'm the vice president of the Little Fish uh, board, uh, one of the new members. Uh, I think there were two that came in with me, um, so one of one of one of the new ones. Um, and uh, I've been a supporter of uh, arts education for for a long time. Um, my son is a cartoonist. I kind of got into arts education through um, being a dad, being a comic book dad. So he's a cartoonist. Um, I would go into his classes and I would help set up um, comic book uh, courses for kids um, in the schools that he was in. Um, but I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer. I do a lot of different things with the arts. So I'm, I'm, arts education is very important. Excellent. Uh, Nikita. Hi, I'm Nikita Atrash. I'm an independent comic book creator, although most of my work is published online. And I'm also a student and assistant teacher at Little Fish Comic Book Studio. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Margo. Hi, Margo. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for KPBS Public Media here in San Diego. And I am also the program manager of the One Book One San Diego program, which has featured comics since 2014. So we're in our eighth year with that aspect of the program. And Anna. Oh, my name is Anna Isabel, short for Anna. Well, no, long for Anna. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to be an ATA for Alonzo at Arts before having a back out due to COVID-19. Um, I love art and I enjoy hearing and telling stories. Cool, excellent. Uh, and I'm Alonzo Nunez, the executive director uh, and founder of Little Fish Comic Book Studio. Uh, Little Fish is a nonprofit art studio here in San Diego uh, and advocacy group, uh, meaning we teach classes, we run summer camps, uh, and then uh, in a general sense, I run around uh, San Diego telling people why they should support the art form uh, and what makes comics so good, both as entertainment uh, and as an educational tool. Um, so uh, uh, for those of you that don't know what a nonprofit is, uh, in essence, a nonprofit uh, has been given a uh, kind of governmental stamp, in essence, uh, for the good that they do uh, in the community. Um, and um, it allows you to apply for grants, uh, and it's kind of a, um, a kind of um, mark of uh, distinction, kind of, and um, sets you apart um, without getting into the nuts and bolts, uh, and allows us to kind of pursue that mission. Um, we've been in San Diego uh, since 2012, which means this, this is our ninth year of operation, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, we do not feel, it'll be 10 years next year, which is uh, kind of insane. Um, and uh, this panel is very different than uh, Little Fish's uh, past Comic-Con panels. Uh, in part, right, we are coming to you like this. Uh, but also Little Fish, um, as with most things uh, in the United States, went through a big change uh, this year in March, uh, with the advent of uh, COVID-19, uh, we, along with everyone else, went uh, into shelter in place. And uh, what that meant is we moved all our classes from the physical studio to uh, the digital domain, the, uh, the Zoomverse, um, as I like to refer to it, um, and transitioned uh, rather quickly as we had to, uh, so as to not kind of interrupt the flow of classes um, and kind of the general sense of community for, uh, for our students. Uh, Nikita, as a uh, student who has been here uh, for, for a while now and has kind of seen the studio grow and change, you've been there as we moved, uh, what was this change like? This change was certainly an interesting one. I think I was kind of like a guinea pig for it because I'm immunocompromised, which meant the first instant that we heard this was happening, I was basically sheltering in place. And so I was doing a lot of sort of testing the waters with Zoom and Google Hangouts for Alonzo. And then this all hit and it's just like, 
okay, so we're doing things at home now. On the bright side, I don't have to travel anymore, but it's kind of weird not being in the physical studio space. Yeah, and we just uh, reopened uh, for summer camps this past week, but we're still doing classes um, online. Uh, all meetings are online, um, as uh, including, uh, but not limited to One Book, One San Diego, uh, meeting uh, weekly uh, with Margo. Uh, Margo, this is your first year uh, taking over uh, One Book, One San Diego. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what a year to start. <laughs> um, what was that like for you? I mean, professionally, even emotionally, that is... Uh... Yeah, you know, I've worked on the program. This is my third year working on the program and my first year managing it. And I think it was like, um, maybe I was two weeks into sort of taking over the reins when we had to, we all got sent home. <laughs> um, but fortunately, reading is a thing you can do at home. And so, so far, not good, it hasn't affected us that much in terms of our, um, the schedule. So for, for just to explain a little bit about one, what one book is, it's a citywide community read. And uh, KPBS is sort of the one that kind of runs it, but we partner with um, libraries and uh, independent booksellers and educators. And every year the public nominates a book that they think all of San Diego should read. This year we received 483 nominations. And we have an advisory council, which Alonzo sits on, um, mostly made up of, again, educators and librarians and uh, community members and we go through all of the nominations and kind of narrow it down and narrow it down and it takes a while but fortunately again that's something that is not that hard to do on zoom so it really didn't slow us down too much we were pretty much on schedule um, and then once the author is selected um, authors i should say because we have three categories we have a one book for adults we have one book for teens, which is usually a graphic, um, and we have one book for kids. And once those are selected, they are announced at the San Diego Festival of Books, which happens at the end of August every year. And we then launch hundreds of free events throughout the community that are based on, inspired by those books, including author events. So we always, part of the the rules of one book is that it has to be a living author because we always bring the author to San Diego. So that that's where the one big difference is going to be this year is that um, at least for our adult author, all of the programming is going to be virtual. It's because the, the, the schedule wise, you know, none of the theaters that we would use are open or safe to use yet. Um, so we are, that's, that's the one thing that's different so far is having to do all of our programming virtual. And it's just as much work. <laughs> it's the exact same amount of work and effort, um, it, but you're not booking a theater, you're setting up something like this and, and marketing it and all of that. So um, it's, yeah, it's different, but not so different that it's unrecognizable. And, and so far we've had really great response to our virtual programming. Um, and so I'm, I am optimistic that people will enjoy tuning in to hear our author uh, live this fall. And where, uh, where can they find that as soon as it's announced? I think the best way to follow that, there's a few places, but really the best two, two places, uh, first on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash one book one San Diego, um, or you could go to the KPBS website if you're not on Facebook, kpbs.org slash one book. And um, all of the updates will be in both of those places. So, uh, and we'll probably be streaming on both of those. I don't know for sure yet, but I, I assume that those events that I'm talking about will be streamed there and in, in, in other places for people to, to participate and watch. Cool, exciting. Um, Mark, uh, as, as both the um, uh, parent of an artist, um, uh, or, or art student, I should say at the moment, uh, and, um, also a uh, very kind of present, uh, active uh, member of kind of the arts community and the kind of uh, comics community in San Diego. Uh, how did you see um, kind of all the adjustments um, uh, during this time kind of play out? 
Well, it's interesting because it, it sort of all came together and happened uh, right after Comic Fest. So we had San Diego Comic Fest. We all got together. We all saw each other. There was a little bit of talk about it. There was a little bit of talk about what was going to happen, um, but we didn't know the impact yet, right? So we had that, and then all of a sudden, boom, everything just stops. Um, you know, I had, I had a couple of uh, film shoots that I had planned that were canceled. Um, Jack had a, my, my son um, had a album coming out, an album release coming out. And so we had to kind of do a music video f at home from footage that had already been shot. You know, we, we found ways to be, to be artistic but that being cut off from the larger community, which is really why I'm involved in things like Little Fish and Comic Fest, because it brings together community. You know, it encourages people to be able to communicate within a group and then find ways to communicate the, what we love to the outer, to the bigger community, right? So, um, it's hard. The, uh, it's great that we're doing a lot of these things. We're, we're, we're doing Zoom meetings and, you know, it's a little, you know, you can see how, exactly how many people are in your community. Five. <laughs> uh, hopefully other people will see it. And, uh, you know, this is, that, that's what this is about. It's about finding a way to talk about community in a way that, that hopefully, um, you know, when we're able to get back together again, it will provide some continuity, you know, so that people know what's available when they're hungry to get back out, uh, join classes again, um, go to conventions again. Um, you know, Comic-Con's all about community. You know, we look at, we look at Comic-Con and we see, um, you know, groups of cosplayers together. We see people camped out you know, waiting to get into Hall H together. And, and they've got those small, small groups where the, the love of the comic art form, um, the, you know, reading in general, uh, those things bind people together. And I think that it, uh, you know, it, it's great to expand that out. Um, I, I think that we're, uh, we're probably all getting a little stir crazy, you know, we're all looking for, we're looking for that community again. And so maybe we're going to find new ways to do it, but I think we're going to be real hungry for the old ways when we're allowed to do it again. For sure. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I see that myself. There's uh, some comic stores have started reopening uh, in kind of a limited way. Uh, and it's really hard to resist the temptation to just go to all of them. Right. Because I've missed them. Right. You know, uh, right. and of course, right. You're, you're wearing a mask. There's social distancing, but of course, um, the only way to be 100% safe is to not go to a store, but you still want to support Absolutely. the stores. And so I'm trying to, you know, uh, as we all are, there's this kind of staggering and kind of juggling of um, community you know, support. Yeah. I will, I will mention um, my favorite event of the year is uh, City of Hope has a, a pediatric cancer picnic for the patients there. And it's not just the patients, it's for the siblings, it's for people who have really been impacted by um, having a child in the family that, uh, that, that has cancer that's going through treatment. And every year I'm involved in this, we go up, uh, there's a, it's sponsored by Disney, but there's a big tent of cartoonists that, that our friend Scott Shaw organizes every year. And, and it's just, it's such an amazing thing. And of course that couldn't happen this year. Of course you can't go into a, uh, an environment like that in, and, and bring people together. But it's like things like that, that I go, man, next year is going to be so much better. We're going to be so ready to, to do that, you know, to really go and see those kids come out of the hospital and be out in the sunshine and have this, this um, event. Um, I, I really do think people are going to be looking forward to them and making them better when we come back. Yeah. Uh, I was just reading recently that um, I don't know how, you know, I don't know the full veracity of this, but uh, I was reading that part of the kind of excitement around uh, what we now call the Roaring Twenties, right? The 1920s was that kind of cooped up energy uh, from a result of the uh, Spanish influenza uh, of 1917-18, uh, which, right, we're going into our own, we're in the 20s, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> Roaring Twenties too, right? History yeah. repeats itself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least rhymes, Nikita, right? Um, <laughs> one of the things that Little Fish was involved in that, um, you know, it, well, had to shudder, but we knew that it, um, 
uh, wasn't going to be canceled but needed to mutate in, in some way was uh, our partnership with uh, Arts, A Reason to Survive in National City, uh, of which Anna is a part of. And this was our first year partnering uh, with uh, Arts, uh, with um, uh, generous funding from One Book, One San Diego, to go and create these stories uh, based around um, students' kind of lives and experience. Uh, and once, um, once COVID hit and uh, all the students had to stay in place, uh, I was left with a huge stack of kind of uh, preliminary papers, right? So uh, if any of you out there have ever um, done your own comic, uh, really it, it applies to a lot of art in general, uh, you know that kind of uh, art is kind of an iceberg, right? There's, there's the final product, but there's all the preparatory stuff that no one ever sees. And we had kind of started to get the iceberg going and it was just starting to peak out of the water. And then we kind of just had to, you know, I'm losing the metaphor, let it sink, right? Um, but uh, I reached out to art students um, and uh, we continued these uh, at home, um, although continuing is a little bit of a misnomer because they all had to start from scratch, right? And they had mm -hmm. some, some idea in their mind of what they were doing, where they were going. Um, Anna, can you talk about that process? Like what did you bring with you uh, from the pre-COVID time into your eventual story? Uh, how did you, approach that um and was there any kind of of letdown did you ever feel like ah, i don't know that i want to do this well so when i first when we first started the project um i was more of the ata so i wasn't expecting to actually have my finished project but at the moment i was just kind of doing it by side it was originally just like a small part of a bigger story that i want to work on once i'm older and have a lot more experience and so I was working on that originally, but then the moment COVID hit, it just didn't seem right to have it as the final product, even though I kind of wanted it to, but it just didn't seem right. So I decided to just start all over again into a three-page comic, a mini comic about um, just a little girl or boy, just, you know, seeing everything from their perspective. It was, it was a bit of a letdown because it was such a huge turn that I wasn't expecting to have to write something like that. Um, but in the end of the day, I, I'm pretty happy with how it turns out. It's, but it was a sudden change for me. And this was your first ever completed comic story? Yes, that's my first ever completed comic story. Which is awesome, right? Uh, bonus points for doing it in the middle of a pandemic, right? Um, <laughs> not many people can say that. Um, I'm sure even a lot of legendary cartoonists uh, didn't uh, do their first work in the middle of a pandemic. So that's, a, <laughs> that's an extra gold star on, on top of the one you've got, Anna. Um, and so after, after um, Little Fish and Arts finished uh, this comic, uh, which we named Into the Chronoverse, um, we worked with uh, a local print house to um, put all of the stories together and get them printed. Uh, what was it like seeing, now you've got this first comic story that you've done, Anna, um, and now it's printed and there's like a hundred copies uh, sitting around. How does that, how does that feel? It, it feels interesting because I wasn't expecting that to happen at my age. I expected that like Maybe once I'm in like my 30s or something, but not at my age. So it feels kind of weird, but like nice at the same time. It gives me a lot of hope that I will be able to write an entire graphic novel one day. So it's an interesting feeling. Yeah. And uh, kind of uh, speaking to what you were saying, Mark, it's, a, it's, it's weird now having uh, this you know, 100 physical copies of uh, this really great comics that the students did. Because usually the next natural step uh, when we do partnerships like this is uh, organize a couple of signings uh, with all the, all the principals involved, all the kids, right? At a comic store, at Little Fish, uh, maybe at Arts itself. Um, and now like we've got that, but you kind of have to bottle it up and kind of set it aside, right? And uh, mm -hmm. it's, I'm trying to think of it a little bit like Christmas, right? Like just put a bow on it, and then we're gonna open it up uh, at some point uh, and, and enjoy it. Um, uh, Nikita, uh, you Anna, were, Anna, oh, go ahead, Mark. Anna, don't, don't wait to do things until your 30s. There'll be other things to do in your 30s. <laughs> just do, just do stuff. Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> Nikita, there is a, um, uh, there's two people I think of. One is a uh, uh, comic artist, Joe Kubert, um, and another is a uh, comic writer and editor, Jim Shooter. Um, uh, Mark, you will correct me if I'm getting these ages wrong, but uh, I believe Joe Kubert was 14 when he started. and Around that, yeah. And I think Jim Shooter was 13 when he had his first story published. Legion of Superheroes. Do, do you know, like, the, the, the backstory with that, Mark? Uh, he was a big um, Legion fan. I don't really know the, the backstory, but I know he was a letter writer. He was one of those guys who kind of found that community in the letter column, you know, like in, in the old days, all those guys that would write in, they'd check out each other's names and see who was getting their letters published, you know, and then that led to fanzines and things, you know, guys publishing about them. But yeah, he was just a very young kid who uh, was involved in, in, I think, letter writing. I don't know that he had a zine. I, I, I think that he was just involved in that. He may have written in or contributed to uh, Legion of Superheroes, but yeah, he just, um, decided he could write a better script and send it in. Yeah, 13, that's amazing. Yeah, and as far as I know, um, right, and, and maybe uh, maybe this was a story for, for legal reasons, uh, but um, what I've always heard is that DC um, cut him a check and then asked for another script, and you know, the cycle just continued um, and just assumed he was an adult. That's the story, yeah. I don't know if it's true, but yeah, that's the, right. that's the story. Um, Maybe once all the all the principals involved uh, have passed away, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll learn that uh, you know they knew he was thirteen and they were lowballing payments. For <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and breaking all kind of labor laws, right? <laughs> um, Nikita, you were involved uh, in the other kind of big project that um, uh, didn't start during the pandemic, but really came to fruition and finished during this. Uh, can you talk about the uh, graphic uh, Shakespeare project? So. This was a project Alonzo introduced to us, I think around like January or February-ish. Like it was introduced January and like, okay, we'll start February, have like a month to think about your ideas. And so we're like, okay, let's get some ideas down, start drafting, that sort of thing. And then COVID hits and everyone's shunted off to home and it's like, all right, uh, I was going to use studio time to work on this, but I guess now I have to intersparse it along with anything else I was doing at the time. And any revisions basically had to be done via either email or just during the classes themselves. Like, more than one of our Thursday classes was dedicated to having someone in the Zoom call screen share and have the rest of us just throw critique at the wall and see what's stuck. And it was also, like, I think helpful because... One time we had a professional artist. Am I allowed to say his name? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. We had Klaus Jansen come into the class and do critiques of a whole bunch of students' work. And I don't know if that would have been possible without COVID since he's a very busy man otherwise. So it was nice to have a professional come in and look at your work and say, hey, here's what you did well and here's what you can improve on. Yeah, that's a good point, right? Um, uh, I feel like part of the challenge of nonprofits um, and other organizations during this time is finding the silver lining, right? Uh, and and kind of pulling threads on stuff that might actually be pulled into the future, right, with us, uh, like Zoom critiques, right, reaching out. Uh, I would never have assumed that it would have gone so well, right? I've always thought about you need people in the classroom to look at work, but mm -hmm. um, it was kind of fantastic uh, having uh, Klaus Jansen involved. Uh, I'm sure slightly traumatizing for uh, for students uh, who's who's... Right, I always say with Klaus, it's not a lack of talent that he'll be judgmental about, it's a lack of effort, right? So, um, and he will call you out on that. One uh, student had to completely revise her entire, her entire thumbnails because he was like, you're doing too much with this, pull, pull it back. Yeah, but then in very typical Little Fish fashion, uh, once she had completely revised, and I mean like scrapped the entire story, started from, uh, started from uh, the ground up, um, the next week she uh, refused to attribute that to Klaus's critique, which was kind of fantastic. <laughs> was uh, Klaus, was, is his teaching schedule affected by this? I mean, does he have more time now because of COVID? Is that how he was able to do this? I mean, so, um, so Klaus Jansen teaches at the School of Visual Arts uh, in New York City. Um, and let me think, uh, I think, 
it, I th he might have actually still been teaching at this point, Mark, okay. uh, but he only ever teaches one, uh, one class at, uh, at SVA. Um, mm -hmm. And having been one of his former students, I know, I know, the, I know the day and time. Uh, so uh, it was fairly easy to get him to commit to. I mean, it was still three hours uh, of his time, but to commit uh, to that window, right? Um, yeah. As far as I know, SVA switched uh, all of their work uh, digitally, um, yeah. and uh, so moved into that realm. But uh, the semester was already kind of uh, uh, winding down at that point, um, and so was able to kind of pull some time out uh, of his schedule and hop on the call, which was, which was great. Uh, Nikita did, um, like Nikita uh, mentioned, uh, it was an adaptation of Shakespeare work. Uh, Nikita did uh, the famous uh, soliloquy from Hamlet. Um, and uh, as, right, this is another one of those Christmas presents. Uh, at some point, uh, we're really looking forward to getting those works uh, printed as well. Uh, and I mean, we might just have to open up a comic store, Nikita. Just Little Fish Comic Book Store instead of Studio. We can keep the same acronym and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We'll use the back room as the store. It'll be a back entrance. It'll be like a speakeasy for comic books, right? Um, hey, so, I can, uh, I can cut you a deal under the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to have students making little side deals, right? This is five bucks, but I'll give it to you for four. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Margo, um, obviously you can't uh, talk about uh, what will be the selection for this year. I'm dying to, but I can't. <laughs> I uh, and I, I'm not going to ask you to uh, give any hints, uh, but everyone should tune in to the Festival of Books uh, at the end yeah. of August for that. Announcement. August 29th at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, yeah. That has been one of the really cool things with Zoom, I've noticed, is uh, with our digital classes, we've had some students... Uh, pop in um, from all over the country uh, for our digital classes, which was really cool. Um, so I always like to make sure I get the uh, the time zone um, set. Uh, oh, I, yeah, specific, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so Margo, uh, I wanted to ask you, what uh, what is it about kind of uh, graphic novels and comics um, that, um, that uh, one book likes? What is it about the uniqueness of the comic book? Program? Well, first of all, of course, there's the, the fact that it's San Diego. And um, Alonzo, Alonzo and I are both native San Diegans. I don't know. Well, I'm Anna, are you, are you from San Diego also? Yes, I and am. Nikita, is anybody not a native San Diegan? I, I'm not. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Scandalous. Um, so there's that, you know, there's, there's just that. Like you couldn't, you couldn't have a community read and not acknowledge comics. <laughs> you kind of can't. Um, but uh, when I, the first year that I joined, which was in 2018, when I when I first started working on this program, that particular year, um, a comic was chosen as the adult and teen selection. It was the same book. It was the same author, and that author was Congressman John Lewis, and the book was March, book one. And um, I was at the fest, I just started working at KPBS and I was at the festival of books when they made the announcement. And it's not gonna work this way this year, but typically what happens is we have a big live announcement at the festival and then everybody rushes out and buys the books from all the, the tents and the tables there at the festival. And so I was kind of like incognito going around to all the tents to hear what people were saying about the book that had been just announced that it was going to be March, you know. And I was chatting with, a, um, I'll just say she was a senior citizen uh, at, a, at a table. And so she said, she said, I heard her ask for the one book. She didn't say the title, she said, I want the one book. And, um, and the clerk handed her the one book and she was flipping through it. And I said, oh, wait till you read it. It's fantastic, it's so great, you're gonna love it. And she, she flipped it over and she goes, ah, oh, it's a cartoon. I said, no, it's a graphic memoir. It's about John Lewis's life and Congressman John. And she went, ugh, it's political. And I was like, no, no, no. No, it's a really wonderful story of hope and his humble beginnings and how he got involved in the civil rights. And she was like, okay. And she brought that book. And a lot of, I, and I also dropped in on a lot of uh, book clubs that were going on throughout the county when that was the one book. And um, again, lots of senior citizens. 
and on the other side of 30 from, from Anna. And for many of them, it was their first time ever reading a graphic of any kind. And they loved it, loved it. So it was really interesting to have it be the adult category and the teen category, because we know teens are gonna love a graphic. Um, in fact, our educators that we work with um, have told us that th they really love it when we choose a graphic because it makes it really easy for them to work into their curriculum and to get the kids excited about the subject matter. But adults, um, you know, we're kind of set in our ways. It's a little harder. And yet we find that, um, you know, that when you get everybody reading it all together and you have, you know, somebody who can talk about this book with their grandkid who's at Hoover High School, uh, it's amazing how these, this content and this particular genre and presented in this particular media uh, really has an, a, a very powerful reach for people. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing, you know, like Mark was just talking about how people, we just have this need for community and it's going to be a minute before we can all be in a room together or we can all be at Liberty Station together. But we can, you know, in this shared experience of reading something together, um, connect, you know, in, in this virtual space, I think in a, in a way that will keep us going for a while, you know, until we can all be together in, in a more physical, you know, environment. But I, I think it's going to be great. I'm very excited excited to see um, how something like this plays out in a virtual arena. Yeah, I, you know, it's as we transition into not quite what came before, but some kind of new normal that kind of intertwines the two. Um, it is, uh, I am hopeful, uh, and it seems like all of you guys are also that uh, that sense of community um, that artistic collaboration and enthusiasm for uh, for comics, for arts, uh, for arts education um, will uh, will continue. Uh, we're we're nearing the end, uh, and I always like to end these panels by um, uh, asking uh, everyone uh, about uh, some kind of art that they are um, enjoying. Little Fish is so often giving out. Uh, art recommendations that I like to ask other people. Um, so I'll just uh, go around and ask everyone about um, a graphic novel or a book uh, or a movie or a TV show, some piece of art uh, that you are finding uh, inspirational, moving or enjoyable right now. Uh, and we'll start with you, Anna. Um, so I found this comic that's just being released by page, two pages a week called Corvid's Eye by Hope Court. It's a bit, Ironic since it sounds so much like COVID, which is an, an it's really unfortunate timing. Um, but Corvid's I I just really like it. It's about a non-binary person that's just trying to find their ways and like finding themselves really. And I just really like it, and it's bringing me a lot of hope during these dark times. Cool, excellent. Uh, what about you, Margo? Well, it's Pride Month right now. Uh, as we're recording this, uh, and so one of my favorite um, local resources that we partnered with actually last year during one book is the Lambda Archives, and um, it's a, it's an archive of LGBTQ culture here in San Diego. And the gentleman who runs it has foot he has footage of the first Pride March in San Diego. It's just like a little group of people on a well, it's very sweet. And so I've been enjoying kind of just delving into that and looking at the art, you know, a lot of zines, a lot of zines and newsletters and things like that. And so that's, that's what I've been having fun poking around on the internet there. Very cool. Is that uh, accessible to the public? I believe so. Yeah. A lot of it is. Yeah. Uh, Nikita, what about you? I do a lot of reading of like online comics that are either self-hosted or hosted on various webcomic hosting sites. It's so like I'm always finding new things to read or just keeping up with ones that I've been following for a while. One of which is called Leaf and Thorn, which has its own site. So it's a fun read. And if you're into like queer culture and fantasy stories and things like that, I think you'll enjoy it. So 
Excellent. And where do you say uh, people can find that? So that one is hosted on its own. It's L-E-I-F and thorn.com. Okay, excellent. And Mark? I have a backlog of stuff. I have stacks and stacks of comics and books that I have not gotten to. This is actually giving me time to catch up. Right now, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Watergate. I'm going in a deep dive into some political history. So I've been reading a lot of that, those kinds of things. But I'm also working on a project that is a uh, more of a noir crime thing. So I'm going back reading a ton of uh, 100 Bullets. Um, you know, I'm... I'm I have just read a collection of uh, Linda Berry's Marlis. Hilarious. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm digging into things that I'm like, oh, man, I never had the time to read that. So I'm, I am doing a lot of catching up. <laughs> that is one of the benefits, right? Now now is the time to, to tackle those reading lists, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's no excuse, everyone. Uh, get out there and read, right? Um, I want to thank all of you guys uh, for participating uh, in Little Fish's uh, panel from physical to digital, uh, growing and thriving. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of you out there for uh, for tuning in today uh, and uh, giving us uh, giving us time. I hope uh, I hope this panel was fun. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Take you. care of yourselves. <laughs>